I'll go ahead and share. And maybe, um, I don't know if it's helpful to turn on closed captioning. That could be helpful. Um, I'll start right. sharing my screen. Yeah. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my slides. All right, so today's talk um, is called Secrets Beneath the Trees, Exploring the Quabbin's Hidden Historical Landscape with LIDAR. Um, I wanna thank Maria again for inviting me to be here with you all today. I'm sorry we can't be meeting in person. Hopefully everybody's at home warm and cozy. Um, a little background, the reason I was invited to give this talk today is that I have a little experience using LIDAR, which I will talk about later, um, to map some of the visible stone walls and road cuts in the Quabbin area. Um, I was hesitant to accept the first time Maria invited me because I am ashamed to admit I have yet to visit Dana Town Common myself in person. Um, so that is definitely on my list of things to do this winter, especially once we get some snow. I've been told it's a nice time to go out there. All right, so to get started, um, I want to begin with a, a quick land acknowledgement. Uh, the Quabbin Reservoir was built on the unceded homelands of the Nipmuc Nation. And I also want to give a land acknowledgement for UMass Amherst, which is my employer. Um, UMass Amherst is a land grant university founded and built on the unceded homelands of the Pocumtuck Nation and the land of the Norwatuck community. As part of the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862, tribal lands from 82 native nations west of the Mississippi were sold to provide the resources to found and build this university. Part of a land acknowledgement, um, the purpose is to encourage all of us to learn more about the native nations on whose homelands the Quabbin Reservoir, UMass, and we uh, live and work. So a little bit about me. Um, I am the Geospatial Information Librarian at UMass Amherst. Um, I began my career path to reach UMass as an archaeologist. So I have a PhD in anthropology with a specialization in GIS and archaeology. Um, and I've done archaeological projects in Arizona and Greece and Hungary and Croatia. I'm still an active archaeologist in Greece. And my specialty is to use remotely sensed imagery, which I'll talk about quite a lot today, to identify archaeological features. Um, and so that's the, that's the uh, perspective I'm coming to you with or from today. I'm not a historian. I'm not a historian of the Quabbin, so I would love to learn more um, from all of you and your depth of knowledge about this area as I talk to you um, about the kinds of archaeological features that are visible to me. So the outline of today's talk, I'll start by talking about how archaeologists use aerial imagery to map historical settlements, then talk about why the Quabbin in particular is a challenging place to do this in, and then we'll talk quite a lot about LIDAR and why LIDAR as a technology helps us overcome those challenges. Um, and then we'll end the talk talking about some case studies uh, of people in New England and in the Quabbin who are already doing this work of mapping historical features in the Quabbin. So how archaeologists use aerial imagery? Why would we even, why would I have built, you know, a career around doing this? Um, the key reason I think is that it allows us to explore areas of the world that are not easily accessible. Um, as I've mentioned, having not been to Dana Town Common, I have visited Dana Town Common from the air so many times that I've lost count. Um, this is one of the cool things about aerial imagery um, is that we can kind of explore regions that we can't get to physically or that are inaccessible because of vegetation or they're dangerous to access or we just wanna sit in our pajamas while we look at a computer screen. Um, from the perspective of an archeologist, we are interested in answering questions like, how did people who used to live in this area make a living? Um, were they farming? Were they mining? Were they raising livestock? And what are the kinds of features I'd be looking for in an aerial image um, that would help me figure out what, how people were living in the past? Um, we can do that by looking at infrastructure, um, such as stone walls and road cuts and house foundations and um, pits where people were mining. And as an archaeologist, I would then want to infer from these things what this might tell us about their communities, their social relationships, and their economy. Of course, we're talking today about a region that has quite a, a wide depth of historical documentation. So that also helps us answer these questions. Um, but again, thinking about this as a technology we might use for areas that don't have that kind of documentation, um, it may, might help you understand why somebody would 
spend so much time learning how to do this. A quick history of aerial photography um, and aerial imagery really in, in archaeology. Um, I don't know if anyone knows the earliest aerial photography ever taken was taken in 1858 from a balloon in Paris. Um, this was the first documented use of some kind of like aerial imagery to understand the ground or the landscape and the way people were living. And we don't have that photo. The earliest existing aerial photo is this one of Boston, incidentally, taken in 1860 from a balloon. Um, starting in the late 1800s, early 1900s, people became more interested in capturing aerial imagery um, without a balloon. And so they became very inventive and were using kites. And one of my favorite images is a tiny camera strapped to a pigeon. Um, but of course, once we invented flight, um, the first aerial photo was captured from a plane in 1908. And then with the World Wars, aerial photography became prolific. And it became something that um, not only uh, militaries wanted to use, but also scientists. And so one of the first aerial photo programs of an entire state was carried out by a former UMass professor of forestry named William McConnell. He captured aerial photos of the entire state of Massachusetts in 1951 and 1952. And UMass Amherst actually has these photos in hard copy in our basement. Again, I'm the librarian there who gets to work with these photos, so I, I couldn't help but talk about them a bit. Um, and I went out and found the photograph of Dana Town Common that, that William McConnell captured in 1952. Um, you can see this particular photo has a lot of annotation on it. Somebody drew on the photo to mark different kinds of land use. Um, they were forestry specialists, so they were really interested in very refined typology of the trees in Massachusetts. Um, so that's the markings that we're seeing on this photo. Uh, just to zoom in a little bit more to show you how cool this photo is really. This was captured in 1952. So if I can do the math, maybe 15 years after Dana would have been disincorporated. Um, and you can see that the town common itself, which I don't know if you can see my cursor, Hopefully you can. Um, I'm circling around that center clearing in the middle of the photo. We can also see the roads extending east and west. And we can also see some lines here, which are growths of trees around the stone field walls that the residents had built. Um, if we look at the same photo today, so 70 years later, this is what the photo, this is what the area looks like today. Um, there are some clearings, but the previous fields that had been painstakingly cleared are now totally covered with trees. Um, and the roads are a little bit less easy to see. So other kinds of aerial imagery that archaeologists will use um, when we're trying to understand past landscapes, um, satellite imagery. Satellite imagery, of course, became again, prolific starting in the 1960s um, with the launch of spy satellites by the US government and others. And so this, the 60s are the earliest satellite imagery we have access to, but of course it's now everywhere. Um, so this is an image from Google Earth. You can open your phone and open a map and, and look at this image. And what we're looking at here is a part of the Greek landscape where I do my research. And we're looking at a ruined settlement that's a thousand years old, um, somewhere around, you know, 1000 AD is when people were living here. Um, if you can maybe look real closely, you can see, again, I'm using my cursor to show some areas that look like stone piles amidst, you know, olive groves. Um, in combination with the satellite image and also going to the site myself, I was able to map the, the buildings that used to you know, that people used to live in. So here we see the rectangles, which are all the houses and the circles are all of the cisterns. And so this is one way that archeologists use satellite imagery to help us map. Um, this only works in an area like Greece because there aren't a lot of trees. There are enough to make it hard to see, but not so much that we can't see the ground. Another technology that you'll see archeologists using quite a lot these days is what's called uncrewed or unmanned aerial vehicles or UAV 
also known as drones. Um, these are now very cheap technologies. So every archeologist I know has a drone that they will throw up into the air and capture some photos. And the really cool thing about drones is it allows us to capture imagery at low angles. So this is a really great photo showing you an oblique angle where we're seeing a landscape um, from an angle that lets us see the shadows that are being cast from the sun. And that lets us see things that are different elevations. So the trees that are tall are casting really long shadows. If this particular site had some stone walls or raised features, those would also cast shadows. Um, and so this is just an example of some drone imagery. And the other cool thing about drones is that it lets us capture a lot of aerial photos that overlap with each other. Um, what we're seeing here is a screenshot from a program called Agisoft um, Photo Scan, currently known as Agisoft Metashape, it changed names. And this allows you to create 3D models using just a bunch of aerial photos that you capture from a drone. Um, so it stitches these photos together. It figures out um, you know, what areas of, of this site are lower and which are higher. This is just an aerial looking straight down view of that 3D model. Um, but already we can see the problem that trees pose. So if somebody were to go to Dana Town Common and try to capture aerial photos from a drone, um, the number of trees in that area are going to make it really hard for a program like this to create an accurate 3D model. So. I've already kind of given away the punchline of why the Quabbin is not so great if you're an archeologist trying to study the past landscape there. Um, there were four settlements that existed in the area in the early 20th century, Dana, Enfield, Prescott, and Greenwich. Um, and of course, when the area was flooded in 1938 and everyone had been moved out, um, the day-to-day -day human activities that they had been carrying out to help keep these settlements clear of vegetation ceased. So they were no longer repairing roads. They were no longer fixing the stone walls. They were no longer cutting back vegetation and keeping their fields cleared. And for all those reasons, um, any of the parts of the community that were still above the waterline became hidden by vegetation and new growth forest. And this is what makes it really hard to use traditional aerial imagery techniques to study the Quabbin. So just to give a little perspective, um, these are two pictures from Google Earth of different town commons. On the left is Montague. Um, and so uh, you can see it's a bustling community. It's still inhabited. Um, Hopefully you can see my cursor. I am highlighting the town common, which is a little triangle, which is a very similar size and shape to the town common in Dana, which is still above the waterline. But we can see how much of the area around Dana is now trees. <laughs> we cannot see underneath them. So this brings me to the title of the talk, uh, Secrets Beneath the Trees. If we were able to see beneath the trees in the Quabbin, um, to see the ground, we'd be able to identify many remnants of past human activity. We'd be able to see those road cuts, um, even house foundations where houses used to be, and we'd see stone walls, basically everything that residents built over time that is still above ground. These are some pictures. Um, if you don't know about this resource, I wanted to share it. Um, the Massachusetts Metropolitan District Water Supply Commission, which is the organization that documented all of the structures in the area before it was flooded, um, has these, they took photographs and they drew maps and many other documents that are all available on digitalcommonwealth.org, um, which is basically a place for official state documents and photographs to be shared with the public. So I encourage you to check out this resource so you can kind of browse some of the old photos of these of these structures that no longer exist. Um, other things that we'd be able to see again if we could see beneath the trees would be stone walls, which is my personal favorite. I'm a big fan of hiking and I love whenever we I encounter a stone wall while I'm walking and these are prolific in the Quabbin area. So this brings us to the concept of LIDAR. Uh, LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. Um, you might see it capitalized in different ways. It seems these days people don't capitalize the whole acronym, but it is an acronym indeed. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how LIDAR works so we all understand what's happening here technologically. So a LIDAR system is made up of a laser scanner and a specialized GPS receiver. And a GPS uh, global positioning system is a receiver that lets us know very accurately where in space that receiver is. Um, 
And the more powerful the GPS, the more accurate that reading is. Um, the system is often mounted on a plane or more and more these days, as our technology is getting better, we're able to mount them on UAVs because UAVs are becoming more powerful and the sensors are getting smaller. Um, there was a period of time when, when UAVs or drones were new that they didn't have the power to, to carry a LIDAR sensor, um, but now we can do that. And so um, the next few slides are going to have some images that I've pulled from publications um, about archaeological applications. If you're interested, I encourage you to, to check these out. Um, there is uh, a link here, a DOI. These should be open access, so you should be able to access them um, for free. So what we're seeing here is a LIDAR sensor that's been mounted to a Lebanese military helicopter. Um, so the archaeologists who were working on this project wanted to capture LIDAR of their study area. And for uh, political reasons, we're not allowed to use a drone or UAV. And so they had to work with the military to do this. Um, how LIDAR works. So as the plane or drone is flying over the area, the laser scanner is emitting pulses of light. And as each light particle comes back, is reflected back to the sensor, the sensor measures the amount of time it took. And from that amount of time, it can calculate the distance. And so in that way, it's able to know how much distance between the sensor and the ground surface that it detected was. Um, and this creates a little point that we'll see in the next slide. Generally, with all those points together, makes a point cloud, a very dense cloud of points. Some of those light points will hit the very top leaves of a tree. And so they'll come back very quickly. Others might hit a branch halfway down the tree. Others might be able to find a path through all the leaves and hit a stone wall and come back. And then finally, you'll have some points that are able to reach the bare ground surface. Um, so the sensor is receiving all of these points and tracking where in space they were when they hit the surface. So once you collect all this data, this amazing rich data, you end up with this image in the top left corner, um, a LIDAR point cloud or a dense point cloud. Um, the next step in processing this is for a technician, usually with the help of some kind of fancy computer program, it will classify these points so that you can say, these are the points that hit tree leaves, these are the points that hit stone walls, and these are the points that hit the ground. From there, you can make what's called a digital elevation model, or a DEM which is basically a representation of the elevation surface. Um, and so in this bottom image, we're seeing another um, image taken from an archaeological publication. So this was a LIDAR field survey. It's the same one as before in Lebanon. So the leftmost image labeled A is what's called a digital surface model. That's the model using all of the LIDAR points. So you can see it's a very textured image. There's like bubbles and bumps, and those are representing the trees and the buildings. Um, but if they classify those points and remove all of the trees and buildings, what you're left with is the image all the way on the right, labeled C. That's called a digital terrain model. And so that's a representation of the Earth's surface as if there was no vegetation and no buildings. This is how we're able to strip the trees from the data that we collect with LIDAR and create a representation of that ground surface as if there were no trees there at all. So one more example from another publication is showing you an image taken. This is just a, an aerial photo on the left taken of a medieval fort in Italy. And you can see, you know, maybe if you look real closely, you can see there seems to be some kind of bump in the middle. But when we look at that same area with the LIDAR data, it becomes very clear that we are seeing a fort that has a defined kind of perimeter wall around it. Um, so this is just representing or illustrating the power of LIDAR to help us see beneath the trees. This is an image taken of the Dana Town. Well, it's not the Town Common, but it's somewhere near the area of the Dana Town Common. So on the left is the basic standard Google imagery of this area. In the middle is the Bare Earth DEM created with LIDAR data, having stripped out the trees. So we can see right down the middle of the, of the image is a straight line and also cutting across the kind of horizontally. Those are road cuts. So those are where there used to be roads. You can kind of see them in the photo on the left um, with the trees, barely kind of faint lines in there. 
And then all around the roads are more lines in a kind of grid pattern, in a regular grid. And those are the field walls. Those are the stone walls that residents used to build um, to, you know, either just to clear the rocks from their fields and or to, you know, keep livestock, sheep, and things like that. Um, so the image on the right it was done in what's called a geographic information system or GIS. Um, and I'll talk about this project at the end of the talk, but basically I worked with students and asked them to digitize or map all of the features they could see in the LIDAR. And so a student um, traced the road cuts with a blue dashed line and all of the raised stone walls with the red solid line. So you might be wondering at this point, how do I get LIDAR data? <laughs> Maybe you want to check out what your house looks like with LIDAR or, you know, some other part of Massachusetts. The really good news is that LIDAR data is really easy to find um, in Massachusetts. We have a state agency called MassGIS um, that provides free public access to all kinds of GIS or spatial data. Um, the state carried out LIDAR surveys between 2010 and 2015 of the entire state. Um, and they used the LIDAR data to create a digital elevation model with a resolution of one meter. That means, um, you know, uh, every pixel cell in this data set represents one meter by one meter in space. If you think about, sorry, I actually don't know what meters are in feet, sorry. <laughs> Archaeologists tend to work in, in metrics, so go with me on this one. But if you imagine being outside on a hike and you see a stone wall, um, the stone wall is probably less than one meter wide. Um, so having one meter resolution data, it's okay, but it's not great. Uh, it'd be much cooler if that data was higher resolution, if it was like 50 centimeters um, to give us a better you know, resolution of, of the, the elevation surface. But I do want to point out that one meter data is available for the entire state. Um, and this is a picture of that digital elevation model of the whole state. MassGIS is now ca uh, capturing updated imagery. Um, they, starting in 2021, started collecting data for the eastern half of the state. So you can see in this picture, everything in green was part of the new 2021 survey. And they are now capturing LIDAR at that 50 centimeter resolution. So that's super cool. Um, but we can see that they haven't quite, I don't think they have quite reached the Quabbin area. So the western half of the state still is to be surveyed. Um, so we can all look forward to seeing that soon. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about some case studies where folks have started using LIDAR to map traces of historical settlements. We'll start big in New England and then hone in to the Quabbin. Uh, but first I want to talk a little bit about methodology. So archaeologists, when we are interested in documenting and finding new sites and features, we use a method um, that's often called um, tracked or grid survey. And so this is a picture of real archaeologists walking a field doing tracked survey. Um, a quick side note is that I watched a couple of the, the DCR videos from last year, and there was one by Jillian Whitney. Um, a day in the life of a wildlife biologist. If you haven't seen that, I recommend it. But she has a couple really cool maps in there where she talks about using tract survey um, to map the locations of moose in the Quabbin. And I was really pleased to see that the same method is something that archaeologists use. Basically, it means we're walking in a straight line and documenting whenever we see something. And that helps us create maps of a much bigger area and do a better job of you know, representative sampling. So track survey is something we do on the field, in, in the field when we're actually there in person, but it also applies to remote sensing surveys. So here's an example of a, of a publication that came out just last year um, using remote sensing survey of the Fertile Crescent. So this is, we can see modern day Turkey and Syria and Iraq. And this team never visited these areas, or at least if they did, they didn't visit all of these areas. They used um, corona satellite imagery and historical aerial photos to identify Roman forts across this entire area. Um, and the way they did this methodologically is they split up the area into a bunch of grids, like grid cells, and then assigned them to surveyors and said, okay, 
surveyor A, you're going to look at this grid cell. And every time you see some image in this little swath of imagery, please digitize it, mark it as a site. And that's how systematically they're able to look at aerial imagery for the entire area. So this a similar strategy works um, for New England and the Quabbin area if we're interested in mapping these sites that are visible in LIDAR. So the first example I want to point to is the New Hampshire stone wall mapper. I didn't personally contribute to this project. I don't know if it's actually still going. Um, it looks like it might have been active as of a couple years ago, but I definitely encourage everyone to check out this information page. They have a story map, which um, talks all about stone walls in New England and the history of them and what they were used for. And it's a really fascinating write up about this. Um, but this, if you were to go to the New Hampshire Stonewall Mapper website, um, this is what the platform looks like when you log in. Everything we're seeing in bright pink is a stone wall that somebody in the community mapped. And they were looking at a LIDAR image, just like we saw before for the Dana area, and drawing a line tracing that stone wall. Um, so you can see that most of New Hampshire seems to have been covered by this project. The really cool thing about this is that it was a what's called a community uh, crowd. It was a crowdsourced project, which means anyone could contribute. Um, they have a status page on their website, which shows that as of whenever I took this screenshot, 16,000 miles of stone walls had been mapped in New Hampshire um, and two, over 215,000 individual walls, which is pretty cool. So this kind of stone wall mapping project, as far as I know, is not happening in Massachusetts, at least not at the state level. But uh, Massachusetts DCR um, has been working on mapping some stone walls in the Quabbin and Ware River reservations. And so this work has been carried out by staff in the Division of Water Supply Protection. Um, I thought to name them, but I wasn't sure exactly all the folks who were involved, so I thought I would keep it general. Um, but this data that they've been putting together is available online. Um, I'll talk about ArcGIS online in a few minutes, but this is the URL if you want to go check out that work that they've been doing. And I have some screenshots here, so you can, if you don't want to log in, you can just look at this screenshot. Um, so this is a map of all of the walls that they've mapped uh, in the Quabbin and Ware River areas. And we can see in the bottom left corner a legend which shows where they got the information. So everything in green is a stone wall they mapped using LIDAR. And we can see that they have also mapped um, using other means. So for example, the taking sheets, which I believe, I could be wrong, are documents um, that were recorded at the time that the parcels were um, either purchased or taken by eminent domain um, from the residents of these areas. Um, and also we have field documentation, which means they're going to the actual site and documenting the field wall, their stone wall in person. Um, and also I just want to, I copied some information about that layer um, in the top left corner. Um, it sounds like they are still updating this as time goes on. So I'm going to now attempt to play a short video. I hope it works. <laughs> this is um, just a screenshot of me navigating this data set in ArcGIS Online. So you get um, a little- Sorry, yeah. interrupt real quick. Have you ever, uh, did you share the sound um, on your presentation? Uh, there is no sound in the video. Okay, great, okay. Okay, sorry. great. Yep, it's just a screenshot. Let me see if I can get it, oh no. Okay, it's still going. Cool. Yep. This is just me, um, you know, opening that layer that I shared the URL for. Um, if you haven't ever used ArcGIS online, it can be a little, seem a little complicated, but the basic idea is you can grab and pan the map just like you would in Google Maps or Bing Maps or something like that. And so I'm just showing you the extent of the stone walls that were, that have been mapped already by the DCR folks. And also, to show you quickly how to navigate. So I'm opening the layers and the table view so I can see every table entry. Every single line that we see on the map has a corresponding table entry. And so we can see in there who mapped it, when they mapped it, whether it's been verified, and how that particular stone wall was digitized. And if I select an individual uh, row, I can then click the Zoom to Selection button. And that will take me to the individual 
uh, stone wall in the data table. So that's quick, you know, how you can navigate the web map. Alternatively, you can just click on an individual stone wall. So I'm now zooming into Dana Center. I'm clicking on this particular stone wall, and that retrieves all the information about that stone wall. Um, so I can see, for example, the one I just clicked on, you know, oh, there's another one I just clicked on. I can see the length, how it was documented, and so on. Okay, it's the end of that video. I'm, I'm guessing that worked. Yay, awesome. <laughs> now, how do I, okay. So here's, um, just to show you again, you know, we've seen a bunch of these images already, but I never get tired of looking at them. Um, so on the left, we see more clearly the stone walls that DCR has mapped. And on the right, we can see how much of that is under tree coverage. And if I remove those so we can see, we can see almost none of those stone walls if we look at just an aerial image of that, of that area. So this is the cool thing about LIDAR. Um, all right. So the last case study I want to talk about is the work that I did with um, a series of classes in the UMass Amherst Classics program. So this all came about because of the pandemic. Um, the faculty member who was teaching archaeological survey methodology um, was not able to meet with the students in person and show them how to do tract survey. And they asked me, what would you recommend? How can we teach students about archaeology? And I suggested remote sensing survey um, because it's something you can do. Every student could do from their own computer. Um, it's the same idea or concept of assigning a tract to a student and that they are responsible for looking at the imagery and digitizing the archaeological features they could see. So the data sets that I put together in a web map were the LIDAR. We already know what LIDAR is and where we found it. I also retrieved or found DCR's parcels layer. And this is a really cool data set that DCR has made available that shows all of the historical land parcels. So that means like property with property boundaries um, from those four settlements that existed before the Quabbin was flooded. And it has links to the photos of those parcels. So you, not all of the parcels have photos, but if it does, um, then it's highlighted in orange and you can click on it and click on the photo and it's really cool. And also I found a historical map from the State Library of Massachusetts. Um, I'm going to show you both of those things right now. So this is the parcels layer for the Quabbin area. Everything in orange has an associated photo that's been linked to it. So this is an example. If you zoom in into that web map and click on one of those parcels, you can see that the triangle I've highlighted is slightly outlined in blue. And we can see all the information about that parcel. So this particular parcel, very close to Dana Town Center, was owned by Margaret MacArthur. Um, we can see the map sheet parcel ID, the number of acres, the year it was taken, 1931, the town it was in. And there's a lot more information in there as well as a hyperlink to the photo. And if I click that hyperlink, it takes me to Digital Commonwealth in a web browser where I can see a picture of that property and more information about it. And this is the historical map that I provided to the students. So this is from the 1870 Atlas of Worcester County. There are many more atlases that are available uh, through the the archives of the State Library. Um, I, could, I don't know if there was one a little closer to the 1930s that would have helped, but I was really interested in showing, you know, students a documentation or a historical map of what the area looked like before the town was disincorporated. And so we can see it's quite small here, but the blue area corresponds to Dana, um, and that town center is that cluster of annotation in the middle. We also have an inset showing Dana Center there, and it's got names of the people who lived in each of the houses and the location of the cemetery. And so I put all of these sources together into a web, web app, um, or a web map really, but for the purposes of sharing it out publicly, I made a web app that you can all explore through that URL, or you can hold up your phone and take a picture of that QR code, and it should bring you to the website um, where you can play around a little bit and turn these layers on and off. Um, and you can see how those students digitized the features in LiDAR. Um, this is a screenshot from that web app. Um, so there's some information here talking a little bit about the project. Um, and we can see that I, I restricted the students to an area of the Quabbin around Dana Town Common. 
Again, the reason being that Dana Town Common is the only town common above the waterline. Um, there's definitely features that would be worth mapping elsewhere, but we wanted to concentrate there for now. Um, and we can see in this map that everything in red is a stone wall that the students digitized and everything in yellow is a road or path. Um, you know, that they thought looked like a straight line cutting across the terrain. It is also possible to see house foundations, but we did not ask the students to digitize those. So I'm now going to play another video where I'm just doing, again, a, a screenshot showing me navigating this app um, to help you get familiar with it. So on the top left corner, there's an info button. If you click, you can read that information that we just saw in the screenshot, and then you can X out of it. Uh, the next item is the legend, just to give you a sense of what we're looking at, and then a layers panel. And a layers panel allows you to turn on and off each of the layers in this web app. Um, so I also have the DCR stone walls layer in there and the DCR parcels. So here, everything in white has a, has a, a URL. Um, that one I clicked on doesn't, but that one does. Photo link, you click on more info and it brings you directly to the page with a photo for that parcel. And I also have the historical map as a layer that you can toggle on and off. This map has been georeferenced, so it's in the right you know, area in space. So as you zoom in, you can turn that on and off and see what was marked on the map versus what you can see in the LIDAR today. All right, that was my video. It's still going. What else am I gonna show? Oh, and there's also a swipe option. Um, you can turn on the swipe button, which allows you to basically swipe whatever layer is selected. So right now, LiDAR is selected. If I check UMass LiDAR survey as well, then it will also uh, control what the students digitized. And you can turn that on and off so you can practice, see if you can identify the same stone walls that the students did, or maybe you see more that they missed which is likely. Okay. I'm gonna wrap up this presentation I'm right on time. I love that. Um, by inviting all of you to practice playing with these data sets, all of this is free. Um, not gonna say it's necessarily easy, but I, again, I'm the GIS librarian at UMass Amherst. And Although I mostly work with students and faculty at UMass, I do love working with the public. So you're invited to reach out to me if you have any questions about any of the technology I've talked about today. Um, so one way that you can play with the data sets we've been looking at are to just use ArcGIS Online, which all the both of the videos I took were, were taken in ArcGIS Online. Um, basically, ArcGIS Online is a hosting platform for data. Um, it's what most government agencies right now are using to share their GIS data. You don't need an account to access the layers. So all you would do is click on a URL, like the two that I've copied here, and then click, there's a button that says open in map viewer. And that's how you can explore. Um, if you wanted to make your own map, and you know maybe you're interested in doing like what my students did and digitizing your own layers, you would need to create an account and purchase a subscription. And the cheapest subscription is $100 a year for ArcGIS Online, just for you know casual public mapping projects. Um, or if you're more ambitious and are really curious about GIS um, as a tool, as a mapping tool, um, there is a free and open source GIS software I highly recommend called QGIS, which you can download for free. And then you could then bring in some of these free data sets we've been looking at. So you can download the LiDAR from MassGIS. You can download any of those aerial Mc uh, McConnell aerial photos from the 1950s, um, which we are slowly making available online. Right now, about half the state is available. Unfortunately, not the Dana Town Common. <laughs> that part we have not finished your referencing yet, um, but you can get a lot of other photos of Massachusetts. Um, and that's where I'll stop. What questions do you 